<laughs> that was a terrible shot. Burn it up. So I thought it was good. You ready to pop that top? Pop that top, son. This is the start of the... Uh... Beginning of a beautiful relationship. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's no longer a We're situation ship. <laughs> We're official. <laughs> We're official. We're, We're live. We're, yeah, there you go. Podcast is on uh, audio platforms. And if it's not, it will be any day. Any day. Yeah, yeah. there you go. The fifth episode. Apparently, you guys like it, so apparently, we're doing this every week. Oh man, that's going to be fun to keep up on. We got through a test pilot. How are you feeling about the content treadmill? Content treadmill. Yeah. So when you start doing something like this, you can't just up and stop for a while, right? So yeah, it's uh, it, it has started to feel a little bit more like <laughs> oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, because you know up until this point, I haven't actually had a schedule or a a deadline, uh, which I've known for over a year. That I should have one. So the beautiful part of this, as stressful and as hectic as it is, it's going to force me to keep a regular schedule, and that will translate into the other content that I make. It's like, all right, if I got to do this every week, I got to do. I need to be doing this every week. I need to be doing this every week, and I might even have like a scheduled launch time and stuff. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> Sorry, I just I I always when I started this, I didn't want to take it too seriously and just wanted to put it out almost to the almost against YouTube in general just to do it. Didn't want to, didn't care what was going to make you more popular. Didn't care what was going to get more views. But at the end of the day, if I, if I can create things that are more popular or get you more views, there's more people getting exposure to what you're trying to show, teach and get people to learn. So I have to care about it a little more than I do. So, and, uh, Timmy over here will remind me when I'm doing dumb shit. Well, my, my, <laughs> my advice is always the same advice I gave you to anyone that wants to get started with, hi, how should I start filming? How should I start this podcast? Get started. That's what you did. Get mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. And then you get started and maybe you realize you have a style or a thing you want to make, but you can never outvalue the time and lessons learned by doing than by thinking about it, planning about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, all of those lessons are so valuable. It, it just, it adds up. And... Everyone's like, hey, how do I get started? And I don't know what to tell them because you don't know what you want to make until you start making it. Yeah. And then it's like this its like this really rough clay that you just start molding and molding and molding. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, this is how I want to make stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the edges are a little smoother. And then maybe you're like, well, that was fun during that phase, but now here's this other style I want to make. Mm -hmm. So you live and you learn and you can't – and you will never forego those valuable lessons more yeah. valuable than by doing. I definitely understand now because you used to tell me, just do it. Just do it. Just yeah. do that. And I'd, I'd get so frustrated. <laughs> yeah. It's like, no, you're supposed to tell me some secret method to be able to yeah. do this correctly. And you're like, no, just do it. And now I get it because you'll figure out what works and what doesn't. You'll figure out what's important to you and what's not. You'll figure out how, and understand it better, whereas you wouldn't have got that if somebody said, just do it exactly like that. Yeah, so, and, and your style is not my style. My style is not right. your style. Your style is not... Uh, anyone else's style, so you you have to get roll. You have to get the snowball rolling before it can accumulate snow or whatever. Absolutely. And I'm, as much as I was a little frustrated originally, I'm very glad. There's been probably a half a dozen things with you since we've started interacting where um, the initial discussion or whatnot would actually frustrate me. But looking back on it, it was the best thing I could have had. It's like you had the insight that I didn't get or understand. Um, and I'm very grateful that you have done things the way you've done them and discussed things with me the way you have, which didn't seem quite right at first, you know, but it, it actually works out. And that's uh, that's honestly a, a lesson for life, you know, just because what you've got going doesn't look the way you think it should look or taste the way you think it should taste or smell the way you think it should smell. Power through it, figure it out, do it to the best of your ability, and then you look back on that and you might have a completely different perspective of what you thought you were going through at the time. Yeah. I'll tell one quick story, and it, it re relates to this, and, you know, I love uh, cameras and photo and video. It's it's like a – it's 
something I love. But there was two classes in a college. Class one was instructed to take 30 days to plan the best photo they could make, take and execute that photo. Class two was told, go take a photo every single day Mm -hmm. for 30 days straight. And at the end of those 30 days, class two had the best photos. There you go. Because they were in the act of doing, not planning, doing. Exactly. That's funny how that works. You know, (laughs) you don't think it at the time, but... It, it's uh, it's it would frustrate the crap out of me to think for thirty days I'm trying to take one picture. Yeah, that would drive me crazy. And then there's planning to a fault too. That's mm-hmm. a thing, or not assessing what you're doing and changing. Like, and I'm sure you've seen this with archery. It's the person who shows up every day and just mm-hmm. shoots their bow. They never work on the thing they're bad at. They never work on maybe where the chink in their armor is. And that's where that that doing mentality has to be balanced with assessing. You know. Or evolving, oh, what yeah. is the thing? Oh, for sure. And you, you always learn way more from mistake and failure than yeah. you do from success. So if you don't practice failure, you're practicing to fail. Yeah. I mean, you have to work your way through that period. And that's uh, that's an interesting method in that class. Yeah. It's very interesting. Well, Reading's coming up. It is. You want to close that door? Yeah. Uh, I think that's rolling good enough. There you go. Uh, in fact, Reading, I leave tomorrow morning at uh, 6 a.m., and I've shot my bow two different times total. <laughs> um, and uh, although I, I know it's relatively close and relatively accurate, and whenever you go to a different environment like that, different temperature, pressure, elevation, apparently it's going to be very bad weather, windy and rainy. It's going to suck. Um, you kind of need to recite your bow in that environment mm-hmm. anyway, so I'm not that terribly worried about it. The little app that I have allows me to change my my drop and my ballistics relatively quickly. So I'm not terribly worried about it. And uh, I'm throwing an extra target. We're driving, so I'm throwing an extra target in the back, and we have a little house rented. So if we need to do some shooting at the house, we probably can. So uh, it should be a good time. Uh, I'm sad that, um, that Brian's not going with us, but justifiably so. I mean, just lost his dad and got a lot going on at home, so I was really looking forward to having him on the trip. But uh, – Justin and uh, Josh Lander, or I like to call him Ned Flanders, which he <laughs> where's, hated where's so Ned much. Where did Ned Flanders come from? Uh, well, that's from uh, The Simpsons. Yeah, that was that's the right. neighbor of Homer's yeah. neighbor, Ned Flanders. Uh, but Josh Landers, and and for some reason, someone always added an S to the back of his name. So when you heard it, it just it's got made a ring, me think. Right? Of, yeah, it does. It's got a ring, and yeah. God, he hated it. Mm-hmm. He worked for me for a while, and man, he just absolutely hated that nickname. And every time I see him, I go, "Hey, Ned, how's it going?" Oh, man, he just gives me that look. So I can't wait to see him in the morning. It's the first thing I'm going to (laughs) say. But, yeah, we're all meeting here and driving down down there. It's supposed to take like 11 or 12 hours. You going to do a single shot? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, we're straight through. We've got a a VRBO there that's – I think we'll be checking by 4 tomorrow. So we'll probably – probably won't get there until 5.36. I run to the store, get some supplies, and then we have to shoot the next morning. And by supplies, is that like a certain amount of beers or? Uh, probably some snacks, probably some food, probably some uh, adult beverages, I would imagine, would be on the menu. Um, although I don't, I don't think Josh drinks, actually. Uh, Justin does a little bit, but uh, I don't think Josh does. So it might it might be a uh, after-hours boring trip, but I, there's a bunch of people I know down there and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure I'll have a good time regardless. And I've uh, never... I've never gone to that when I could uh, go out and hang out with people, so that'll be uh, a fun time. Well, it's going to be sure. cool for you to go there, too. I mean, that's going to be like your crew, man. That's going to be... Yeah. You haven't been there since you've been doing this whole... Oh, man. Yeah, I haven't been putting there. Putting yourself on the internet and flashing the internet Dude, or I whatever been, you call I it. I haven't been there 10 years before I put myself on the internet. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. It'll be, be interesting to see. I don't think that in, that community pays as much attention to this stuff as like the tech community sort of thing would. I got a lot of a lot of surprising response at TAC, which I think my channel had only been on for half a year at that point. Um, but a lot of, lot of positive feedback, more than I expected. Um, but we'll see if the uh, if it's the same sort of thing. I mean, I know there's vendors there, and I've, I know people that I've dealt with for a long time will be there, but I don't know if it's the same type of community. My guess is it's not. They're more the serious target folk, less of the fuck around gang <laughs> like we are, you know. But I'd like to argue who's having more fun. I was having a... <laughs> A discussion, and I've had it like half a dozen different times in the last six last month um, about 
why certain things are popular and why certain things aren't when it comes to this sport. And I think that uh, TAC is popular largely because nobody keeps score. Or nobody's supposed to keep score. And I've kind of argued that for a long time with these communities. It's they got these serious score things. And I understand that, but I think that's part of the allure that's going on at these mountain events or, uh, or TAC, for example. I think sells out so stinking quick. And no one is keeping score. Yeah, I think TAC is a bit of the perfect storm of experience meets growth of social media yeah. meets growth of archery because in, there's been a trend recently for these experience type things that they're getting more and more popular and partially because of social media and this could be the good or the bad of social media but people are enjoying sharing those experiences yeah you know like most people that are going to attack are posting about it somewhere True. right there yeah. and um, it's kind of that perfect storm where archery's gotten a lot cooler you know? Yeah, it's definitely gained a lot in popularity, and it's more of a – like I remember when I was a kid, I didn't tell people I shot a bow. Yeah. Like yeah. I didn't want I didn't want to get made fun of when I was a kid. Yeah. Now I, it's, it's kind of the opposite, which is kind of neat. And I, I don't know if um, if I would have been made fun of or not, but I, I was something I didn't share for the most part. I had a couple of friends that knew I was into archery. You know, if they came over to the house or whatnot, obviously they're going to see stuff. But, um, yeah, I, I didn't even tell people, and now I think it's something that uh, – a kid would kind of brag about a little bit, which is pretty neat. We've had this shift to, the, to more of a, a little bit more of a, a traditional hobby mindset, or you know, maybe it's a little more acceptable, which is great. And I really hope we keep pushing that direction because at the end of the day, we need more people hunting. We just do, and that any, anything that brings that out. And um, I was having a conversation, <clears throat> oh geez, almost a month ago now, with some people that were looking at tack and trying to see what what it's real, what the value of of it is and what what they do right and what they do wrong and what's could you make and reproduce that you know or could you make something better than that and the the mutual agreements uh, of that conversation and there was a half a dozen people in this conversation were more of a camping hanging out in the parking lot kind of environment that Tech has gone away from in the last couple of years to where you can't camp in the parking lot anymore and what have you because that's Everybody was just hanging out, having a good old time. I it's guess like that Woodstock, was, man. Yeah, I mean, Woodstock's bit. a lot cooler if you yeah. can stay there, right? A little bit. Yeah. It was the. Um, it was. I think it was the year before was the last year you could do that, and then you couldn't do that after that. I think that was a, a big mistake on their part. I think that would have made it even more popular. Which, what do they need to make it more popular for? They can't. They it sells out quickly, right? So, but if you're going to try to do something a little different or add a little into that, I would think that would be a good positive and maybe. Um, Maybe a little more family oriented, just a little bit. I mean, it's it's fine to take your family and whatnot, but it does kind of seem like a boys hang out for the most part. Which don't get me wrong, I'm a boy. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. It was a good time. Um, but I would think you could gear it a little differently. But that whole resort style event um, place to stay, if you you know plan ahead, I think there's uh, I think there's some valuable stuff in there that maybe we can help grow this sport even more by having more kinds of events where no one's keeping score. I think that's a – I'd watch I'd watch the more serious 3D shoots got or the more serious events got around here, the less people participated. Mm -hmm. And that seems like idiotic. It's like why are there less people participating? Well, for some reason or another, whatever you want to call it, when people don't think they can win, they don't want to play to a degree. There's a percentage of people that want to work through the adversity, right, and get good enough to win. Or simply want to get better by participating with people that are better than them. There's a percentage of those people too. But by and large, there's a large percentage of people that don't want to play if they don't think they can win. So they won't go. Or they won't turn in a scorecard or whatnot. And that's fine too if you want to go to a shoot and don't turn in a scorecard. But I think I think we're really missing the boat. I think we should be having these events with no score. I really do. Well, we've seen a couple of them pop up recently. There's, there's a little slew of them now. Mm -hmm. And uh, archery for fun, man. It's like... I don't know what the balance is in golf. That's always my comparable because I, I, I'm a golf instructor. I have my own golf instruction academy. And uh, there's a certain amount of professional tournaments, mm -hmm. tours, PGA Tour, mini tour, uh, stuff you can get paid at locally. Mm -hmm. But there's these things called scrambles. Yeah. You, are you know what a scramble is? Uh, vaguely, for uh, okay. clarify, so I make sure I'm talking about the a right scramble is like most commonly is four of us playing one group and we all hit from the same spot to try to make the best score. Yeah. 
So you all drive, you all go to the next best shot. It's low pressure. It's fun. It's a it's a for fun deal. And often scramble tournaments have very little payout or none. And uh, there's got to be, I don't know, 10 times as many scramble participants than professional tournament participants. And that, you well, know, sure. that's kind of what you're talking about with archery is like archery for fun is probably an, still an underserved environment. Very underserved environment, if you ask me. And that that format would be interesting. Yeah. If you and four of your buddies are out shooting at the same target and whoever's got the best shots, what we get to keep. Yeah. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Uh, I think that, that would, would be cool. That yeah. would probably do really well. Well, and we've done versions of this with uh, like a best ball or um, mm -hmm. if you and I shoot on the same team, whoever gets the higher score contributes. So it's a little more pressure's off, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have somebody's in the foam or whatever, and then mm -hmm. you can shoot at a 14 or you can shoot at a center yeah, ring. Yeah, like or, the OPA format yeah. or whatnot when you're shooting as a team. That's that's a cool way to do yeah, it. Yeah, it's fun. I, I, the one I did last year, the first one I'd ever done like that, that was neat. I didn't really understand the concept super well, so I didn't play it as well as I should have. It took me until the second day to figure oh, out Oh, the gamesmanship of it. Like, yeah, yeah. What, what's the right gamesmanship here? And um, that, But it was a lot of fun, and yeah. I could see that. But once again, there was 90 people at that. Well, the way those things boil down, too, is like a lot of people will game them, and there's certainly uh, their strategy. But at the end of the day, the people that are going to win are the ones that still shoot the best. Right. Typically, Minus, yeah. I mean, you might make a decision or two here that might change things. So, Well, it's no different yeah. than a handicap system. Yeah, In a handicap similar. system, basically there's less of a spread. Yeah. At least that's whenever I did like an 80% handicap league um, for archery stuff, that's what basically ended up happening. Unless somebody was deliberately sandbagging and managed to get a little bit better every week mm -hmm. over the week before, um, the guy who won was still the same guy. It's just the score was a lot closer. So the people that wanted to feel like they had a chance felt like they had a chance. And that's, that's a good thing. I mean... At the end of the day, we need more participation. So we need more things that everyone would want to participate in rather than 10% of the population being willing to participate in. And it seems like the people that go to tech seem to be bow hunters, like in general. Like when I, when I get to know who's going and when I have conversations with people here locally that are going, they're bow hunters. They're not hardcore target archers. Yeah, it's or, kind of the perfect pregame for hunting where it yeah. forces you to get ready. Mm -hmm. You're shooting angles. Mm -hmm. You're ready, say in July, when maybe you otherwise had to be ready in August or September. Yeah, it's so a, it forces your hand a little bit. Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of like the the spring bear hunting thing. You yeah, know, it's forcing you to be prepared way earlier, which is a very good thing. Uh, it just it I'm trying to figure out the spark at what makes that work, and I really think it's I really think it's that that it's fun. Oh, for sure. I think you're you're spot on. It's for fun. Yeah. It's for experience. Yeah. It's for a community, and it's created uh, – I guess community would be the right word. It's created its own niche audience that, you know, there's similar groups of people that get excited to go to the same events every year. And then those people show up, and they're excited to see the same people. I mean, yeah. if I were to go to uh, Big Sky this year, which I don't know that I will or will make it this year – but if I went, I mean, I'd be stoked to see all the people I've seen from years past. Mm -hmm. You know, friends I made in Montana, friends I made from Idaho, and they all congregate at this area, and it, it creates that uh, that environment. Yeah, it's very, it's a very neat situation. I mean, at the end of the day, this is all about relationships and community, and I don't think we do nearly a good enough job at creating a better community or a more inviting community. And I think by eliminating score, that makes it more of a community-driven thing. And they've proven it can work, right? I mean, you're talking, what do they have, 10 of them? Yeah, I don't They're know. Ten, it's a lot. It's, yeah, they have like 10 events. and they It's a always, lot. I'm surprised that the ones they have sell. all over the east, all over the yeah. south. like Yeah, they always sell out too. Yeah. Like always. And it's not cheap. It's not. I mean, it's not ridiculous. You spend way more getting there typically unless it happens to be really close by. But it's not a cheap event. So there, there de there's definitely a demand, right? So Is it more or less than a ski ticket? It's more than well, I don't know, because it's a it's less. a couple of days. It's probably less than a ski it's ticket. Less, yeah, yeah, it's less than a ski ticket. People spend money to have fun, you know. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. all hobbies cost stuff, you know. So I I think their price point is, you know, it, it's in the ballpark. It could could be low. I don't know, but people are showing up. They're filling them out. Um, and yeah, nothing would be cooler than to see like pretty much every place that has a ski resort having a a tournament. 
that could on I, it because there's it. those things sit for the most part. Yeah, f- uh, bike riders use them, you know. But in general, those mountains are kind of empty when there's not snow on them. Yeah, be totally easy to do. Well, anything that lowers the barrier to entry or makes it more fun, I think, is a win for the whole. Yeah, right. If you can evolve kids earlier, if you can keep parents involved because their kids are involved. If you can make it easier for someone to show up and do something with with less strings attached, like how much easier is it for a, a teenager or a newbie archer to show up at a 3D event where they don't have to give a shit about their score? Right. I mean, their only give a shit might be how many arrows might I lose today? You know, yeah. well, Which, I know that was my largest concern. <laughs> still, <laughs> I, heard, a concern, I heard nightmares. Man. So I was yeah. terrified. Yeah, I still only I think I only lost one, but man, and then I tar- was target number one. Was freaking out! I found that arrow. Oh, and it that's was right. and it was intact. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I still shot that arrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it was uh, it was a terrifying thing to hear the stories. Like Nolan had gone to one like that like a year or two back, and he ran out of arrows the first day and had to drive back to town and buy some arrows that were close so he could shoot the second day. I mean, the arrow oh, manufacturers should be large sponsors for those. Events. I thought they secretly were, man. Yeah, <laughs> like those yeah. things are designed to just yeah. eat arrows. They're the RIP arrow graveyard. Yeah, for sure. Although I, th- I think that if you had the the target a little more exposed, because I mean they're already a long ass ways away. Yeah, right. You're shooting at in some instances you're shooting at a third scale elk at fifty yards, and that elk's supposed to represent fifty yards at twenty yards. So if you do the math on that, that elk's like one hundred twenty five yards away. Yeah, I mean that's a poke for that size of a target, and. I'm fine with that. I'd just I'd like to see them a little more exposed, so you're not like hitting rocks at 70 yards, where the vitals partially covered. Like you don't need to do that. You can yeah. you have just as much fun having it be still challenging because your distance is making it challenging. Yeah, and covering the elevation that you cover throughout a day is making it challenging. So I, I don't think it needs to be so obstructed to where there's just every target you come up to, there's a dozen to two dozen arrows laying on the ground broken. Dude, like, ugh, I don't know. I am in the business of selling arrows, though, so I probably shouldn't complain. I mean, I, I carry pretty much everything under the sun. I'm sure I make money because of those things. But um, www.podymarcher.com. Yeah, <laughs> throw that in there. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, just stretch it out a little more and maybe have them a little more open so at least it doesn't feel so brutal. There were there were several that you couldn't shoot at the vitals. Well, at hey, all. we're in a position now where maybe, you know, we could do something cool like that in the future. Some type of community event. Um, yeah. You never know. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be really neat to do. It's just the time. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. <laughs> I think yeah. about it right now. I just go, oh, 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 yeah. I don't have time. I mean, I'm already doing too much. That's right. But, you know, as uh, as we progress and as things improve and as uh, business is even better, which I'm assuming it will get better than where it is now, it's all good. But, you know, that should, in theory, free up a little time. Maybe coordinate something like that, but yeah, more than anything, it, I think it, community events, things like that nature, are really what we need more of. And it needs to be, it needs to be something that people outside of the sport would be interested in seeing. Making it more exciting for somebody who's not interested. I think we're missing a, a big portion of this. Not spectator friendly. Like, could somebody just come up and watch what's going on and actually see a good exposure to it? That was that was something that I thought was really missing. In a way that was safe too. In a way that was safe. Well, like have you know five shooting stations from or five different shooting positions from basically the same spot, so you could actually have bleachers and people could watch. Interesting. These people come through and shoot these over and over and over, so it was a little more entertaining. Interesting. You yeah. know, like find uh, find other reasons for participation because maybe somebody sitting in those stands two years from now goes, I really want to try that archery. That looks so fun. Yeah. But where can you functionally see it effectively from a, from an interesting standpoint, you know, where just somebody who doesn't shoot could still watch it and enjoy it? So you were a first-time participant at Attack last year? Yes. First time? Yeah. Do you want to give someone, like, the Cliff Notes version of, like, show up to Attack, what to expect? Brutal AF. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, my first target was 80, 88 yards and a sheep with a rock in front of it that you couldn't see the vitals. Like, my brain, like, looked at this, and it wouldn't compute the reality that it might not be functionally possible to hit the vitals. So my brain went, well, they got to have that rock, like, close enough to me that I can shoot over that rock and and still hit the target where you're supposed to. And nope, you can't. I nailed that rock, just sent an arrow right into oblivion. Um, and I'd say every 
third or fourth target was like that. Like it was functionally hard, like very hard to hit the vitals. And you had to start like running logical management. Like I'm not going to try to hit the vitals on that. There was, God, there was one target we all came up to where there was a tree covering the entire vitals and you could get a five pretty easily, but you might snap an arrow and a half trying to get an eight. And it amazed me how many people still tried to get an eight. I'm like, this is freaking dumb. <laughs> Like, there's all kinds of real estate right here to give me a five. I'll take a five and hang on to my arrow mm -hmm. for the next target and the next target and the next target because I only have so many, right? But, um, man, it's it's amazing, and I don't know I don't know what that is in somebody's brain, but it is brutal. Like, if you're not a really good shot, you probably ought to have a couple dozen arrows. But they have courses that are a little more friendly, too. Yeah, it depends. You can pick. Like, that, that Rocky Mountain course that we shot was way easier. Yeah. There was still some challenging stuff, the one we shot the second day. Um, there was still some challenging stuff, but it wasn't nearly as hard. Um, they were stretched out a little bit, but it wasn't like ridiculous. The I think we shot the Sitka Force course the first day, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. if that if that's right, and that was very hard. Uh, but you know, you're it's called the Total Archery Challenge, so it's supposed to be challenging, it's supposed to be difficult, uh, and they do a good job of that. And they sell it that way. They sell it that way. Like you, yeah. you should be aware that's what you're getting into. And you know, if you didn't bring more than 12 arrows with you, you're probably going to have a bad day. Although, I mean, I only lost one, but, man, I got really, really close to losing several. I mean, I'd nick stuff or get super close to hitting something that I know would grenade my arrow um, and just managed to not. Mm -hmm. I think that was more of a luck thing. I don't I don't remember how many um, other people in the group lost, but I think I lost the least out of everybody that we shot with. Yeah, and you're good at archery. I'm pretty right. good at archery. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't I don't practice enough to say I'm great at archery. Yeah. I'm pretty good at archery though. I have a uh, a learned gift over time. I think I'm pretty good, but I could definitely be a lot better if I committed to it. So that's kind of the course, and then uh, tell me about like the community aspect deal. Uh, everybody was really great. There is there is like a vendor village to hang out at. There was uh, God, one of the booths was just giving away beers to everybody. There was uh, little events afterwards. Um, but everybody was just really nice. It seemed like everybody just kind of wanted to hang out, which is why the no camping in the parking lot thing was kind of a bummer because mm -hmm. you, you're kind of taking away from that prolonged interaction with people over time um, and people's ability to come up and talk to you. Yeah. You know, which I tried to. I, I couldn't walk through the vendor village like without stopping every 10 or 15 feet yeah. to have a conversation with somebody, which, I, which, mind you... I, I really do enjoy, so don't be, if you run into me or see me at one of these things, don't hesitate to come up and talk to me. I authentically really want people to get better at archery, and I want them to understand and know what's going on, uh, and that's at my core. Like, I just two weekends ago, I was spent 20 minutes talking to a volleyball dad <laughs> at a volleyball tournament um, from out of the area that was just wanted to ask me questions. He's like, I know you're not working, and I don't, I'm like, no, you don't get it. I really want to help, so bring it on. Feel free to come up and talk to me. I won't shun you. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the year prior when we did camp there, like we stayed in tents and cots and stuff, but mm -hmm. we would wake up and uh, John Dudley was like 30 yards away. Yeah. Uh, John Barklow, you know John? Sitka guy. Uh, Sick a guy way into archery, um, mm -hmm. does has something to do. Oh, with, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I know, I know who you are. He's into right. survival or whatever, but yeah. like one morning I rolled out of my tent and John Barklow was right there. And like, I didn't know John that well, mm -hmm. but he knew Dan and um, I got to BS with him for like 30 minutes before everyone showed up and like Jocko and mm -hmm. Dudley and we're all there. So it was like this really cool captive environment where. After the tournament, you hang out, drink beer with people, like uh, mm -hmm. like you're camping, you know, you're a campfire to campfire, hang out, and then in the morning, have coffee, whatever. It was just, it was fun, man. It was a little bit like Woodstock for archery. I've never went to Woodstock, but I mean, if archery <laughs> had Woodstock, that's that's you probably would, its version of it. Yeah, you would probably imagine it was kind of like that. Yeah. If you can... A lot of people sleeping on the ground or whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, but that's uh, that's an experience. Yeah, a big experience. It's a big experience, and that's that's a great part of what they've they've managed to rope in a lot of the social media and public personalities to get involved in that. And I'm sure that's a big part and a yeah. big draw. Um, and it doesn't, I think Dudley goes to all of them or damn near. Yeah. I think that's a schedule now. I don't know for sure. Um, I'm like 10 or 15 days out from hunting. 
And I wanted to dive into the uh, rabbit hole a little bit about broadheads and arrows and hunting setups. Mm -hmm. I, I know that this is something that could go a lot of different directions, but my first hunt is for spring bear. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about like arrow setups for adults that want to shoot a bear. Adult arrows? Not adult arrows. <laughs> I mean, because I say adults because, you know, a kid's setup would be different. Sure. Or someone who's not strong, not pulling a lot of weight, might yeah. be a little different. Yeah. But for your... So maybe we should preface it by saying you're probably shooting 65 to 70 pounds, yeah. you know, 28 to 30 inch draw length, average human being, yeah. adult male. For average human beings. Average human beings, sure. Yeah. Well, uh, bears aren't super tough. Hide's not super thick. Um, honestly, if, you, if you're running that kind of weight and you run just about anything between 400 and 475, you're going to do totally fine. Uh, if you're hunting ground blinds, tree stands, things of that nature, and you want to build something just for that purpose, I wouldn't hesitate to be heavy, honestly, because it's not going to matter. You're not you're you're not losing the things that you lose by having to shoot far away with a heavy arrow, right? So if you're coming right out of your bow at 20 yards, there's there's validity to uh, super heavy setups. There really is. Um, however, if you want to build something that you're going to use for everything. And not just, this is my ground blind, tree stand, bear hunting bow, which I'm a nut. I do things like that. I yeah, build you a do. bow. Well, I mean, I I got like a thousand bows down there. I yeah. mean, I might as well have an excuse to build one for whatever I'm doing. And I'll build a, a tree stand, ground blind hunting bow. And then I'll build it different for states if their laws are different. But Can, can you compare a bear to like a bear setup might be similar to a whitetail setup? Yeah, yeah. A bear setup and a whitetail setup, in my opinion, are going to be real similar if we're talking to a standard black bear. Yeah. Um, cause they just don't get that big. Granted, bear will get bigger than whitetail, but it's like they don't have as much muscle mass per ratio per fat. And like I think that makes everything soft. So it's it's really, really easy to to get it done on a bear, in my opinion. In, so. my, in my friend groups, I haven't seen an arrow not pass through a bear. Yeah. Well, I shot my first bear at eleven years old with a Martin Lynx. Was it uh, which one of which one of those um, bears on the wall? There's uh actually it's um it's that rug right there. That's the first bear I ever killed. Yeah, that black one. Um and that was uh that was at twenty yards. Whoop. At twenty yards in I think uh that was that was in Washington when you could still bait in Washington when I was uh, a kid. Um they didn't change that until I was like seventeen or Did eighteen. Did you have your master certificate? We didn't have such a thing back then. And I still don't have a master's certificate in this state. For, for baiting, though? Oh, uh, you didn't need it then. <laughs> no, I mean... <laughs> You're being smart. Yeah, yeah I get it. Yeah. Um, but what my I was using a, an Easton 2213 and a Bear Super Razor Head, and I, I think I was shooting fingers. Yeah, I think I was shooting fingers out of a, an old 45-pound compound bow, and that arrow sunk in the ground 10 inches behind that bear. Mm -hmm. So, which, when I look at everything that I've hunted throughout my life... And every experience that I've had, it's the broadhead over everything, hands down. Like that broadhead design is very much a traditional broadhead, old school stick bow kind of broadhead. And it sails right through and doesn't even slow down. It's these modern designs that cause the penetration issues, whether it be mechanical, whether it be blades that are squatty like that instead of elongated like that. You know, two and a half to one to three to one cut ratio has way less resistance on it than a one to one and a half. Just doesn't take as much force to penetrate. Now, once again, we're talking about bears and it really isn't that important, but because every bear I've ever shot at, I went right through them. Yeah. And and almost I, every animal I've ever shot at in general, I've gone right through them mostly. Mm -hmm. um, but that's progressed. Like I, I came and started in a time where broadheads kind of all looked like that. Like these three blade angular things where they started looking like that when, both started getting fast and they couldn't get them to tune and they didn't know how to tune them. So they started making broadheads that didn't deviate as much. That's when penetration started becoming a real issue. It really wasn't. If you go back 25 years, penetration wasn't a problem. It's the broadhead design. Like almost nothing else has changed. Yeah, granted, arrows got a little lighter, but I'm talking about a 2213 aluminum arrow. Those aren't that heavy. They're not. My whole arrow probably weighed 430 grains back then, right? Out of 50 pounds or 45 pounds out of a way less modern bow. Like that bow is probably 50 feet a second slower 
apples to apples comparable today, maybe worse, mm -hmm. right? And it just sailed right through. What's really the difference? It's the broadhead. So if you look at a traditional style broadhead or you're worried about penetration at all, look at broadheads that a traditional guy would use, hands down. But bears, modern adult stuff, I'd, I'd want to have some fun with it. You know, I'd want to... I want to shoot some stuff that put a gash or hole in something. I mean, that's where my head's does. at personally. Yeah, well, but you I, should be. Yeah, I'm not making recommendations for what other people should use, but just in my personal experience has been like arrows pass through bears, mm -hmm. right? I have not seen an arrow not pass through a bear. Yep. So I want to put something that's going to push that and make a big hole because bears do a couple things. One, because of their fur, it can absorb a lot of the blood and – Mm -hmm. A blood trail is a really good thing for recovering an animal, especially when, you know, the area is likely to be thick. Mm -hmm. So I want a blood trail. So I want something wide. I want something mechanical. I want something that's going to punch a wide hole. And I've kind of narrowed it down to, and I put something on my Instagram story the other day. We had a vote, but uh, Grim Reaper Carnivore mm -hmm. and the Micro Hybrid. Yep. Both of which are wide cutting diameters, a lot of blades, a mm -hmm. lot of resistance, but should be a good exit hole. Yep. And uh, I know your thing is you don't like, do we call it aluminum ferrules? Yeah, I, do, I don't like aluminum ferrules, but once again, we're talking about a soft animal. Yeah. So it's not nearly as big of a concern. I'm and I'm not about... testing it to potentially use on an elk. Yeah. I'm testing it to use, hey, what's going to be an amazing bear setup? Yeah, yeah. for sure. And maybe a backdoor whitetail setup. Who knows? Yeah, I would put those in the same boat, and I would build things for that purpose myself. You know, I would build a a bear hunting bow or a deer hunting bow. It's basically just a tree stand ground blind hunting setup. Yeah. It's probably going to be close. Probably doesn't need to be as much weight. I mean, I, it's one of the only times I don't use shoot at least 70 pounds because you just you don't need to. It's, mm -hmm. They're so close, and your penetration is going to be so good that it's really not that critical, at least in my experience. Um, but yeah, having a big cutting diameter is pretty cool. Um, I still haven't hundred percent decided what I'm going to use, but you know, there was a couple that I wanted to test, but I thought about it and I went, well, this isn't really relevant for bear hunting. It's not, I should probably look at something a little bigger. So I should probably, I should probably try a thorn. I, I've, uh, I placed an order with Schwacker to try to bring their products in. And if I get some in time, I, I'll probably pick out one of those and shoot it, but uh, there's so many good Grim Reaper broadheads, it's kind of hard to go against it. Um, and I love the Fatal Steel, but I've already shot that, yeah. so that's not really a very fair one, so I should probably look at that. I know they got a Whitetail Special that's got like a two-inch cut in diameter three-blade. I mean, I think you like, put your hand in that. Yeah. Like, that's, that's rough. And to preface for you, one of the main cheat codes you can have for a bow setup is draw length. Yeah, And you sure. have a 30-inch? I have a 30-inch draw length, yeah. so, you know, I have... I'm, you know, longer than the average bear, your I guess, B, best your, way to put it. Your BSD and the rest of us. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. But I used yeah. to think I had a 28-inch draw, but I guess it's actually 29. Oh, you're 29. So I'm not too bad. No, you're yeah. doing good. Like the average, when I want to say the average, most common draw length is 29, then 28 and a half, then 28, then 29 and a half, then 27 and a half, then I'm not 30. shooting crossbow bolts like some of our short draw length No, guys. no, no. You, yeah. got some, you got a little poop behind it. I mean, you, energy. you start looking at the, the differences in like poundage and velocity, right? Yeah. So if you're talking 70 pounds to 80 pounds, that's like 20 feet. An inch of draw length is like close to 15. So Say that again. Run that back for me. All right. So like 10 pounds of bow weight yep. in an average setup is about 20 feet a second. Okay. If you don't change anything else. You don't put a different arrow through the bow or anything like that. Yep. You're starting with an arrow that's adequately spined enough for the heavier poundage, right? Yeah. So that's 20 feet a second. One inch of draw length on average is close to 15 feet. So basically if I have an inch and a half longer draw length than you, I can shoot 10 pounds less than you and produce the same energy. So nothing trumps draw length. Damn. Nothing. It's so much power, but that's power stroke. So what I just heard, too, is a pretty good sales pitch for using a handheld release and or not an index that's an index that's extended way out. Yeah, that, there's a reason that if you, if you ever get a good look at somebody who really knows what they're doing, their hands back as much as it can be was still anchored in solidly. Like my, if I shoot a wrist strap, which I hardly ever do, but my hand's like that, not like that. There's a reason for it. I want one. The shorter axle to axle bows, when it comes into your face, if you have the string come back a little farther, your head's more upright. That's the thing that feels like most awkward when somebody will pull back a, a shorter axle to axle bow and go, oh, this draw length's wrong. It's like, no, you're not used to the string angle 
so it feels wrong because of where your nose touches the string, right? Well, if you can have the string come back a little farther, your head's more upright, it feels more normal. And so like when bows were 40 axle to axle, which was really common 20 years ago, the string would end really around the corner of your mouth. No different than if you shot with fingers, it would kind of end near the same spot. Now, the string's ending kind of back here-ish, and it's because of the angle of the string, trying to get a good, decent anchor point. So the only way to still get a good hand position is for your release to be shorter, and the distance between where the jaw is and where the trigger is is really close. If you look at a bunch of different releases out there, you'll have ones where the jaw and the trigger are this far apart. That's an inch, yeah, folks. And if you're shooting a, a long bow, like a 36, 38-inch bow, that's probably fine to get a good anchor point. But if you're shooting a 29 to 33-inch bow, you do not want a lot of distance between where the trigger is and where the attachment is because that's position where the string comes back into your face more. If you look at a lot of people's anchors and where the string crosses, you'll see it. It's if you're trying because you're trying to get, you know, obviously the peep, the tip of your nose and the pressure point back there behind your jaw all in alignment. And the only way you're really going to do that effectively well on a shorter axle to axle bow with a longer draw length, mind you, because the longer your draw length is, the steeper the string angle is against your face. So your string angle is shallower than mine because I got to draw it back farther, right? So that's where those positions come in and change. That's why you'll see shorter stuff. And um, distant, distance in a handheld too, you'll see like where the fingers sit and how far up the jaw is. And some people really want that longer jaw because it feels super comfortable in their face, but they're giving up draw length and they're bringing their head down more to touch the string. And at the end of the day, the closer you can be to a relaxed, comfortable position in your anchor point, the more consistent you're going to be on uneven terrain. Flat ground, it's easy. It doesn't matter what how bad your anchor point is or how jacked up your positions are or how too long a draw length you have or how much length in the nose of the release there is. But you put yourself up on a steep hillside and shoot downhill at 30 degree angle, and all of a sudden you can't hold steady at all mm. because it doesn't actually fit you correctly. Those things, Interesting. Those things show themselves in awkward environments. They don't show themselves on flat ground easy environments. So draw length is a hack, basically. Mm -hmm. If you can have more draw length without doing that, something goofy. That doesn't mean deliberately shoot too long <laughs> yeah. of a draw length, people. Shoot the right draw length. The right draw length is stupid important. You can't point effectively well with the another one you've always been an advocate draw. of and taught me is cut the arrow short yeah because it it's kind of not exponential but it's uh it's a large increase on your foc it's a large increase on your foc this is this is the purpose of this more than anything is to try to get a lighter projectile that balances well okay so if you look at what is out there in GPI and what things exist, if you don't cut your arrow down as much as you can, you're not going to end up with decent percentage of FOC. Which stands for front of center. Four to center percentage, yeah. yeah. That's that the tip is leading the arrow, not the back. Yeah. So you have to have a certain percentage of that to get really good downrange accuracy. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to shorten your arrow. Every inch shorter your arrow is, it's about three quarters of a percent FOC on the average arrow bill, don't punch it in a calculator and tell me how much of an idiot I am. I'm talking like a 400 to 425 grain arrow. Because comments are good. Well, that's fine. Call me dumb. I don't <laughs> care. I really don't. I really don't actually yeah. care what people think. But um, the overall length of the arrow being relevant to as short as it can possibly be, like I have a 30-inch draw length and my air, average arrow length is around 28. And the reason for that is I can take an arrow that weighs 9 grains an inch, should put about 150 grains in the front, Reasonable weight fletches, even a lighted knock on a roughly 300 spine arrow. Shoot it up to 75 pounds, and it comes out at about 15%. If I made that arrow two inches longer, let's say I cut it at the front of my riser because I was following the old school method and trying to be safe as a, a, an older shop would have yeah. you do. Now I need a stiffer arrow to achieve the same spine, right? So I need to go from a, a 300 to a 250, right? I need to put, if I care about FOC, which I'm not saying that it's gospel, but if you care about it, you're going to have to add, oh, 30 plus grains to the front of your arrow at that length to achieve the same percentage. So now you're going to need a stiffer arrow. You're going to need more weight in the front. And odds are really good that stiffer arrow is heavier. Right, so now you need more weight in the front. A couple grains per inch probably, right? Uh, well, I'll give it a one. grain. One. I'll, I'll, I'll give it one. Yeah. And so that's one. Your arrow's 30 grains heavier, but that whole mass to your arrow requires more weight in the front to offset the FOC. So now you're like 50 grains in the front. 
And the funny part, when you look at it that way, is if you add 50 grains to the front of your arrow, your arrow is a spine category weaker all of a sudden. So you can't make it work right if you don't cut it down to achieve those numbers. You can, you can fudge it and get close to it, but those are numbers that I have experienced over time are really solid and really consistent. And the more professional hunters or people that you know take it really seriously that you get to know and find, you will find that to be very similar. Like I'm on the light end of the average knowledgeable person because I'll go I'll go below 400 sometimes. Depends on what I'm hunting. Normally in an elk, I'm probably going to be in the low four, low 420s, high 14s, somewhere around there. You know, 415, 425, somewhere in that vicinity, probably. Um, but you will find more people use 425 to 475. It's stupid common. And rarely, rarely does someone who truly knows what they're doing run their arrow long, that long. Yeah. They're almost all cutting it down as close to the launcher as possible because when you start trying to do the math and start trying to make it work, you run into the same thing every time. The shorter I make this thing, the higher the FOC is and the stiffer the shaft is, so the lighter the whole projectile is. So you've you've got to hang out with some pretty cool people over the years. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do you want to drop a few names for people arrow setups that might be in that range? Or well, I know uh, I know Dan Evans actually uses like a four hundred and twenty grain arrow, and he's Dan killed. Evans. Yeah, Dan he, Staten. Uh, Dan Staten's using less than four twenty now. Last I checked, although he's dabbling. If we took his average arrow um, weight over the last ten years, it's he's, probably he started at like five hundred, and he's yeah. down to like four fifteen. Now he's getting really light, um, and every progression is improvement and it's more like oh i don't really believe this so i'm gonna try it <laughs> yeah and then if it works i'll stay with it and maybe i'll try a little lighter the next time um yeah evans is using like 420s using vaps um, do you know and he's actually he's using rip xvs this year because he bought 50 or five dozen titanium inserts and colors <laughs> from me like three weeks ago nice um and so he's he's running the lightest gpi arrow you can buy and that's a guy that the only thing he cares about hunting, the only thing is 400 class bulls. That's all he tries to hunt for. That's what he cares about. And he eats more tags than anybody I've ever met because he just simply won't shoot one unless it's that big. And he spends a month plus in the woods a year just elk hunting. And that guy who spends ridiculous amounts of money, his entire life's passion is using the lightest GPI arrow he can find. Hmm. And he's pretty good at archery. He's damn good at archery. Do you know uh, who Brian Barney is? No. Brian Barney uh, has an association with Eastman's. He also has a podcast. Mm -hmm. It's called Eastman's Elevated with Brian Barney. But, it shows how much I pay attention to my own industry. Yeah, people. no, it's all good. He's <laughs> he's just a really good bow hunter, man. He's mm -hmm. he's he's like Dan Staten's like cousin from Montana. Oh, okay. Like they both hunt really hard, mm -hmm. Western game only mm -hmm. with their bow. Mm -hmm. And I think Brian uses a mechanical, shoots elk, shoots mule deer, all the stuff. And I, I've heard him talk about a setup a couple of times, and I think it's around 425. Shorter arrow, shorter draw length guy. Yeah, super um, common. Aaron Snyder, got to hang out with him. And, uh, well, when Kafaru was in Colorado. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I think his hunting setup was around 500. Yep. Uh, Aaron's got a little longer draw length, shoots a little heavier poundage bow. Mm-hmm. But you start to hear these numbers recurring, and, and often it's it's somewhere between, four, like you said, 425 and 475. Mm -hmm. I've heard Levi Morgan talk about his bow setup before around mm -hmm. 475. Mm -hmm. um, John Dudley talk about his bow setup before around 475, 485. Yep. yep. So kind of a common theme, um, all different people. Some of those guys have longer draw lengths, so that's something to take note of, like we talked earlier. Chris, uh, Chris B is using RIP TKOs this year. Around 475, I think, is his total setup weight. I think he's Probably slight, less than I that, I think maybe. he's under that. Yeah. I think he's more like 450. Yeah. Somewhere in that ballpark. But, you know, once again, very well-known yeah. personality. Less seasoned than those other guys, but certainly... Less seasoned, but yeah, has, you see he hunts a lot. Yeah, a lot. So, kind of interesting you hear these commonalities. I mean, yeah. yeah and these guys do it a lot. They're kind of all using very similar things. And I it's remember, very, very meaningful, uh, right? No, no one's going to uh, risk their career for... For a broadhead choice. Yeah. Or an arrow choice. Um, maybe make a compromise a little, but they're not going to risk their yeah. their career. And um, at the end of the day, no hunter wants to have a poor recovery experience. Yeah. that Because everybody will have one, and when you have that one, you will... You start blaming it on everything but you. 
Yeah. And, every, every, and you just every, take, all the gear, everything you use. And you just and, take all of your choices analyze. so much more, so much differently when you've had that experience. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you prepare a little better. Maybe you put a little more time into your setup because nobody wants that, to have that happen. Yeah. I remember when I first started using those really light uh, victories. Uh, I was at the trade show the next year. Uh, I had put heavier inserts in them. And I, I met with one of the guys at the company. I was like, hey, do you know anybody using your 3D? Your ultralight 3D carbon arrow done with it. Yeah. And he looked at me, he goes, Everybody who works here uses that done with. <laughs> so I mean, if you if you understand how it works, it, it makes an awful lot of sense. And yeah, maybe your arrow's gonna break once in a while in a bad scenario because it's lighter GPI. Um, but you know, I can tell you for for almost certain, I bet you money, Dudley would be using a lighter arrow if Easton made one that diameter that was lighter, because he's very tight with Easton. Mm. So he's gotta kind of be stuck in that in that boat and it wouldn't shock me if uh uh, bill was the same scenario because he's really tight with easton and he likes working with easton and easton doesn't make a five millimeter arrow that's lighter now one question i always have is is we just talked about a lot of these people who are fully grown adults some have longer draw lengths what if your 50 pound bow with 26 27 inch draw length do you go lighter or heavier um i don't i don't know what that energy what what's good Personally, or similar, I don't know. It, a lot of that depends on where you're hunting and what kind of environment you're in. Yeah, how like far you need to shoot. How far do you need to shoot? And I would really, really strongly encourage you, if you're going to shoot that light of draw weight and that short of length, you probably ought to keep it close. You probably ought to not be shooting distance because you're just going to have a hard time penetrating, especially an elk. But I would approach it like a traditional guy would approach it in that scenario. Um, I still would really struggle with going – a lot over like 425 or 450 just because it's going to slow down so much. But you much. want a really good shot. But I want, I want a really good shot, and I want a traditional-style broadhead. Yeah. I wouldn't use anything but in that scenario because because I remember how, how well mine penetrated when I was shooting 45, 50 pounds yep. and 400-grain arrows, and it sailed right through whatever I shot at. So... I would just gravitate towards a traditional style broadhead and accept the fact that you're going to glance off things, you're going to deflect a little bit, but you're going to penetrate an immense amount more. And for years and years and years, I followed my dad around in the woods, who was a traditional archer, shooting 45 pounds and using 400-ish grain arrows. And the biggest key was how sharp is my broadhead and what's the blade angle on my broadhead. Hands down, every time, made the biggest difference. So if you're worried about penetration, shoot. Blade angles like that. There's lots of broadheads out there. Um, Ironwell makes really great, really sharp broadheads, but there's also a lot lesser expensive options yeah. out there that may work not quite as well because VPA of the type is of steel. pretty good, similar ish. Uh, VPA does have one piece machined heads that are pretty good. Although when you're doing a, a one piece head, it's harder to sharpen the blade as well. Um, steel Force makes broadheads that are very similar like that. Magnus makes broadheads that are very similar like that. Um, they all are companies that were based more around traditional broadheads way back when, and then they've evolved as the community of compound guys got so big, you had to make something that was a little more friendly to what they would want to see. Yeah. But yeah, there's there's a lot of them out there. Um, oh, sh- not Strickland. Um, it's it, They're in Oregon. I'm trying to remember. They're like curved. Kudu. 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 Kudu looks like it would penetrate like nobody's business, and the ferals are steel. Like, that broadhead intrigues the crap out of me for somebody who wants to penetrate well. Mm-hmm. Like, if they're if fixated on that, because every part of it's steel, it's not super heavy, it's two-blade, single bevel, looks like a really good quality product. And we we almost brought them in last year, like, right before hunting season. But I'm like, this is dumb. It's too close to hunting season. Well, hey, man, but we'll bring them in this year. I think that's great advice, and I also think the fire's out. It is. That's good. Yeah, buddy. That's our first one on this uh, channel on the audio platform. So leave it a review, subscribe, do that kind of stuff. That helps us. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Follow along. Let us know what we're doing wrong because I'm (laughs) sure you all got an opinion. Love to hear it. Yeah, man. That's a wrap. Um, We're out. Boom, 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 boom.